hope it was good. Um, yes, so my name is Sabrina. Um, this is actually, I'm too tall for this thing. Um, so, last week I was in Amur at Kick Festival and I had dinner with Jan van Tomme, Gwen van Hey, and David Lennart. And over dinner we all shared how we got into creative coding. And I remembered how nice it is to share those stories and how well it illustrates what aspect it is about creative coding that attracted that person to it. <clears throat> when I was thought processing in school, part of the curriculum was reading Golan Levin's Designing with Code, One Artist's Journey, um, from 2001, actually, in which he describes how he got into creative coding. He describes he was an artist, wanting to work with media, but not able to program his own ideas until he decided to learn programming. Saskia, who you will hear about tomorrow, also wrote um, this text, Two Years Making Daily Art, where she describes how she got into creative coding and how impressed she was by generative art and eager to learn how to make her own. Um, recently, Daniel Voiku, um, who created the Facebook group Creative Coding with Processing MP5.js, which has almost 7,000 members, shared an article on Medium, Creative Coding Starting Anew. Um, Daniel already was a front-end developer, but he mentioned a different experience when he learned about creative coding, finding out that you can create amazing things. Um, and then Daniel Schiffman says he learned, to code through, he learned to code through making art projects, referring to the way he learned to code, not setting out to solve a problem, but setting out to express yourself. Um, approach that is led by curiosity, um, like what happens when I change this variable to 6,400 or something. And actually, just over lunch, I met J Julian Zamor. I actually really don't know how to pronounce her name. Um, anyway, and his story was a bit more fitting um, to the having children perspective. I do not have children. Um, but he told me that he got into creative coding as a way to communicate with his child, um, thinking about um, these simple and easy to make interfaces like pushing a button and a light turns on so that the kid can play with that as a sort of way to communicate with a creature that can't really talk yet. I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah, so all of that just to say that although all these stories um, are worlds apart, they all seem to have a similar reaction when getting into creative coding, that of discovering a wealth of work and this exciting community. Um, so I encourage you all to share how you got into creative coding in the next break, which I guess it won't be until the end of the day, over beers. Um, and maybe it's a nice question to approach someone you don't know yet. So I decided here today that I will share how I got into creative coding. This might be a bit of a boring story, but you know, it's like community sharing how we got into things. So I used to study architecture. I went to architecture school in Delft in the Netherlands, and I didn't particularly like it, but I also didn't hate it. I picked a study that I justified for being um, tech creative and technical, um, which I guess I, guess I kind of knew my qualities, but they were just in the wrong location, because six years later, um, I realized that architecture wasn't my thing. Um, I wasn't thought programming before. I played around with Flash a bit, but like, I didn't know any programming, so I didn't get that far. So it wasn't until 2010 that, um, still at architecture school, someone taught me processing. Um, and this was one of the first things I made, which was basically a giant array of points moving around in a circle. Um, I was exploring cyclone-based dynamic systems as a way to explore form and experience. It's, yeah, it's running, it's hard to see with all the darkness. Um, anyway, I kept making new iterations, it's really hard to see, um, and my mind was blown with, the, with these um, little P control P5 library sliders where you can um, change the variables and you really don't see anything, but basically I'm playing around with this 3D rotating particles and things that appear in it. Um, actually, these sketches were from 2010, and I was surprised. I recently opened them and just pressed play, and they still work. It's like, awesome. Processing is awesome. Um, so still exploring these cyclone-based systems, 
in 2010. Um, this was a data visualization of all hurricanes in 2005, the year Katrina hit New Orleans. Um, so the circles are like all the hurricanes in that year, and then the size of the circles is their, I think it was their wind speed, if I remember correctly. And then this is Katrina, a visualization of like the, sh the how the intensity increased and just sort of playing around with it and having this sort of wormy shape. Um, anyway, this was, all, this was all made after my first couple of classes in processing. And to my surprise, I was kind of good at it. So now I was studying architecture, and I was like, ah, oh, this is fun. So I only wanted to make processing sketches from then on. So I went and tried to combine making processing sketches with architecture. Um, because like, I didn't want to throw away my six years of education entirely. So <laughs> one of my attempts was um, this particular processing sketch which has all these branches that coil in and out. And it's not animating right now. But um, basically, the idea, the idea is that the distance from the circle makes them coil in or out. So it, when you're close to the circle, it's coiled out. And when you're far away, they're coiled in. Um, so I was imagining this as a sort of 3D world that you can like, actually walk into the processing sketch, and you can have all these branches around you, and they like, m open up while you walk up to them. <laughs> um, so sort of this super interactive environments and branches everywhere. Um, so I had to get into physical computing, electronics, and Arduino to actually make this happen. And I had it all thought through. You know, like I made these fancy renders. Um, it was supposed to be on a public square. Um, and there was this whole concept about rainfall and awareness about water, where like if the water touches the flat wall. Anyway, it, I never got to make this for real. But it was like sort of my first venture like, away from architecture, combining processing with architecture. Um, however, um, after not doing this, I went to a minor in Delft, in the Netherlands, which is called Interactive Environments. And there we did get to make um, what we, well, designed. So inspired by the work of Julius Pulp, who made artworks with tubing and solenoid valves, we wanted to make a whole interactive environment out of tubing and solenoid valves. Um, basically an environment version of a creative coding sketch. Um, so we had over a kilometer of tubing. Um, and we let these liquids flow through it in different colors. And when you, there were these, these interaction stations. This is like not the best movie for a good overview. But uh, there were these interaction stations. And when you touch them, the liquids would flow through it. And then you could just like sit in the environment and space out over all the things happening around you. Um, so what we used to create these like super condensed colored burst packages of liquid was that one part was water-based and the other part was oil-based so that they like actually stay separate, the color and the, and the not color. <laughs> um, and then in the end, um, it ended up in a container. And because one part was oil-based and the other part is water-based, it, it automatically um, separates again. And so we could, like, from the container, put it all back in the installation and do it all over again. <clears throat> we also got to make, so that was fun. And we actually made it. It was crazy. It was a crazy project. We, get, we were all students. So we got like all these pumps that we used for free and the solenoid valves. And it was pretty cool. And then after it got exhibited in an art space in Enschede, um, where we got to make a UV uh, lit up version of it so that all the colored liquid was like light, lit up with UV light. Yeah, long time ago. Um, so these tools and platforms we use to make the work we're sharing here today have an active community using and contributing um, to the platforms and tools. The community is an integral part of the tool. Um, and I felt that it was an active community when I became part of it in 2010, but I didn't feel like I was part of it. I was, of course, using the tools and other people's contributions, but I wasn't contributing myself. 
I was just a beginner. I don't know any of the people. I didn't know any of the people. It's like everyone on the forum chatting with each other. I was like, I don't know who they are. Um, and I was too shy to just blurt out on the forum and ask stupid questions. Then I discovered these events, media, art, and creative coding events and conferences like this one where we are today. Um, but I went to Resonate. I went to the first Resonate in 2012. Um, and then I went to every Resonate after, except last year. Um, and I had conversations with people from the community, like the one I had last week with Jan and Gwen and Daffit about what they are working on and the weird and exciting, exciting stories that come with doing that work. Um, I could ask questions, ask for suggestions, and all of a sudden I wasn't shy. We were like in the same room face to face. Um, so I even, <laughs> I, I actually did write, write this down, I even awkwardly talked to some of the people I really admired. Um, I bet they all thought I was a weirdo, though, and, but it didn't matter. I was, it was a great experience, and I finally felt that I was part of the community. Um, point being, like, this whole experience of all being in one room was so different for me than from like, the, the forums and everyone chatting to each other. This, I realized this is super personal, and this is for me, but I was like, there has, this is, there has some quality in this, and I want to have this more often. I don't want to just go to these events one time a year and, like, I don't know, met, meet some people that I never see again. I kind of want to have it more often. So in 2014, I started Creative Coding Amsterdam um, together with a friend and at that time, classmate Lisa Rumbaut. This wasn't anything new. And there were many Creative Coding meetups around the world. There were actually these processing cities meetups that I recall actually um, started here in Paris. Yes, no? Um, although, um, by that time in 2000, I think this was 15, they seemed to be um, dead by then. There was a new Creative Code Berlin meetup organized by Raphael de Courvy and Rachel Ua, um, who's, who are my friends. Um, but I wanted to meet people in this niche in and around Amsterdam, so I started a meetup in Amsterdam. Lisa and I sat together, found a venue, and just put a date and time online. Um, we started with an evening of talks, and that there, there is Saskia. Um, this is where I met Saskia. Turns out she was based in Amsterdam, and I had no idea. Um, she, I think you were already making dailies back then? I think so, yes. Um, so that's cool. Like, and also, in, all the way to the left there was Amnon Owet, who makes awesome stuff too, and I also never met him. He totally lives in the Netherlands. Um, but we also organized code jams, workshops, and bar nights. Um, that usually b means that I don't have the time to actually organize something, and I'm just like, let's just meet in a bar. It's a community meetup. Um, yeah, some pictures of our meetups. Um, overall, the meetups are a success. Um, some are visited better than others. Sometimes we have like 50 people, the other times only 10. We, we start to grow some regulars, um, but it always still surprises me um, how many new, new people visit them and walk in and have never heard of any of these tools um, and are like super blown away or like they've never heard of an Arduino. And it's really inspiring and fun to tell those people about all the things we're doing. Um, and also, sometimes very young people. Recently I met this kid, nine-year-old kid, Simon, Simon Tiger, and he makes all these cool processing sketches and shares them on YouTube. And he just contacted us being like, hey, I want to come to Processing Community Day. Um, so yeah, these meetups have been great for that kind of thing. <clears throat> this was a collaboration with Squid Soup, which is fun. They have this giant LED matrix, and we organized a code jam with an open frameworks tool-ish it wasn't a real library, but it was sort of like, if you do this, copy this, paste that, you can control our LED grid. So after having organized these meetups, this is what I feel like the creative coding community is. <laughs> this is a schematic drawing of an amoeba. It is formless and shapeless. It is a bit messy, and it has a life of its own. We, as organizers, actually don't do much. It's his own creature. We're just feeding the creature. So actually, instead of asking, how did you get into creative coding, 
It could be more like, how did you meet the creature? And although I organize these community meetups and people ask me about this creature, I really don't know much about it, if I'm honest. While we've been organizing these meetups, um, we put some effort into inspiring other people to organize their own meetups. Um, and we also got in touch with other people that have their own meetups, because there are more around the world. There's, um, actually, I wrote them all down. There's Creative Code in Cairo, um, the Creative Code meetup in Berlin, as I mentioned. Um, but there's also Creative Coding Linz, Creative Coding LA, Creative Coding London, Media Lab Melbourne. Um, there was a Creative Coding Tehran in Iran for a while. But I think that's sort of down right now. And then Lisa Romaud, uh, the co-founder of Creative Coding Amsterdam, moved to Tilburg, which is a town in the Netherlands. And she was just like, I'll start one here too. Um, and then we, have, we had a Creative Coding Rotterdam for a while and a Creative Coding Maastricht for a while. As you can see, the Netherlands is well represented here. Um, and we also have Creative Coding Utrecht, um, which is only half an hour away from Amsterdam. Um, but they have recently been feeding the creature in the form of amazing and regular events. They're doing much better than Amsterdam. Um, Fabian, one of the founders, is here too. And last week, they hosted an exhibit on the subject of creative coding and creative coding communities, which was called Hello World. So this is me telling you all you should organize your own community meetups and like, be part of this group of people that talk about these things and trying to inspire more people. Um, being in contact with other meetups and other people willing to start meetups is great. <laughs> we start to exchange thoughts and information. We exchange things like, what do we want to do with our meetups? Is it an evening of talks, a go jam? Or do we sit around in a circle and just talk about things that interest us? Um, actually, the Creative Code Berlin Stammtisch is like that. If you're ever in Berlin, you can like, sit around the Stammtisch and talk about fun things. Um, we share each other's meetup stories and, we care about, and what we care about when organizing our meetups. But we also share thoughts on what these meetups can do and how they're positioned and what they can be in the future. Organizing these meetups is basically our way of contributing to the community. Um, we contribute to the use of these tools and platforms. Um, we are feeding this beast. I really like this. I made this up last night. I thought it was funny. Um, we're feeding the beast. Um, and I realized that actually that means we get to decide what we're feeding the beast. We can somehow shape the beast by deciding who gets a stage at these events. Although the community I got to know when I got into creative coding around 2010 was great and active, it was unfortunately mostly male and mostly white. Um, and with Creative Coding Amsterdam, I feel responsible to at least not contribute to its current state, not only give stage to amazing creations uh, made by white males. And as um, meetup organizers, we are in a position to change that. And I love inviting anyone who makes great work, also white males. Um, but I try to always have a diverse distribution of people sharing their work at our events. Um, and I have to thank Nicola again for contributing to that too. <laughs> it's great. Um, I also feel responsible to shape the community culture. Um, as meetup organizers, we get to define the atmosphere. And Ours is always welcoming, so always giving people the feeling that they're welcome. And even if you're a beginner or an expert, you're welcome to share like, your first rectangles on the screen or ellipses. Um, but you're also welcome to share the intricate details of shader programming. Um, everyone should feel free to ask questions. Um, and I always, like say, I always like to say that we're just human beings. Um, you know, we're just in this room all together. Let's just have a good time and not have this whole status thing get in, get in the way. <clears throat> there are some things that are difficult, like don't have any assumptions about a person and don't ever make someone feel stupid. Um, this one is hard for me, too, sometimes. Like last week, I thought a course in processing, and someone didn't know like how to save a file, and I totally got frustrated and I was like, oh, do you not know how computers work? And I was like, oh my god, that's awful. And then I totally apologized. 
But it's hard sometimes to like um, not have any assumptions about what people think and you know like be nice and friendly and help them out all the time. One of our role models is Lauren McCarthy, um, artist and creator of P5.js. And Lauren, too, is aware of her position as a creator. Oh, this is great. Um, as, of, as a creator of a tool and a platform. And this, and thus, yeah, I'm like totally thrown off by this. But I love it. It's art. Um, so as much as the community is an integral part of the tool, so is the tool an integral part of the community. Um, and I could not not mention her efforts for making the creative community a better beast. So back to me. <laughs> um, so I'll, the rest of the talk, I'll talk about what I'm doing in the creative coding community apart from organizing events. Um, just last week, I thought, as I said, I taught an introduction course to processing. And after teaching some basics, students started responding with questions like, all right, so now if I can do this, does it also mean I can do you know, that? And I was like, yes, exactly. You, you totally get it. And for me, the big part of the excitement of creative coding comes from this realization. It's that excitement of finding out how things work and realizing um, now you can do other things with it too. It's this feeling of having the skills and ingredients to make anything you can imagine. Um, and it's roughly based on a simple model of input, processing, output. And it doesn't actually have to be processing like this software, but just like input, something happens, output. I like this image made by Tim, I actually don't know how to pronounce his last name, Rodenbroker, um, from his talk on creative coding, because um, it's hard to see, but basically it has like this shows that any input can be matched with any output. Um, and also, Pierre Luigi de la Rosa um, works with this model, too. Pierre made the Tramontana kit, um, which you should definitely all check out. It's um, made to easily create interactive and connected, um, interactive and connected spaces um, and um, with multiple devices. So it's um, roughly said a processing library no, no more output. A processing library um, that um, uses WebSockets to talk to any um, device that can have a browser. And so he made it so that you can like, use your phone as an input to a sketch and then, or to any other output, for instance, another phone. Um, so you can do like uh, using the accelerometer of your phone to control the sketch um, on your screen and processing, or use the accelerometer of your phone to control the color of the screen of a different phone. Um, and it's all contained, wrapped up in a processing library, and it's super easy. You just install the library in processing and open one of the examples, or you actually make one yourself, of course. Um, so yeah, I just had to plug that here because it's an awesome tool to make anything you want. And like, that's this, I love that about this sort of community. Uh, you have this feeling that you can make anything you want. So although I don't have a strong identity in my work, I do not actually, everything is like super messy and um, I do a lot of weird interactive installations. I think the red threat is the excitement that creative coding um, that creating these experiences give me um, because I feel like I can look at the world and see what's possible <laughs> and not just what is. It's so shaky. Um, so <laughs> one of the projects I did, this is a while ago already too, was Space Labs. And <laughs> what we tried to do, we, th we were thinking, um, what if you could actually put on a VR headset, and then you're like in the space, you put on a VR headset, and you can actually see the same space, but in different time. So it's sort of like time travel. So the idea was that you have an installation, um, and you can scroll through time, like Black Mirror, but it was before Black Mirror. And we were thinking of making um, this 360 degree image of the space, um, and then just stitch them all together as a time lapse. And then if you would 
go into VR, you would be able to scroll to time through the time maps. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a 360 camera, so we made this like beautiful rig with two GoPros that turn around. And then we had one for the right eye, one for the left eye. And then they first had to make the entire circle. And then we stitched all the pictures together to two 360s, one for each eye. Um, and then, which obviously was a bit funky, because if you take like that long to make a 360, everything changed by then. So people started moving through the space. And so the 360s weren't perfect. Um, and then we had this um, little pod sensor in a swiveling chair so that when you sit down, you're, the rotation of the chair makes you scroll through time. So you could like put on the headset and look around in 360 and then sit down and, and also scroll through time and still look around in 360. It was a bit trippy. Um, but it was super fun and super uh, nice project to work on. Um, I actually worked on this together with Caroline Teunissen. And she is like, uh, her weapon of choice is VVVV. Um, so the whole VR part was made in VVVV, which is also a really fun too, if you want to get into it. Um, then I made um, this VR project also with Caroline. Oh, this one is also too dark. Um, and it was an experimentation in embodiment. So we were, we were playing around with this VR. But you never have a body. Well, nowadays it's already different, but back then you never had a body in VR. So we thought to team up the headset with a Kinect. This was like the first Oculus. And then we just put a Kinect. We just tracked your body with a Kinect and just put the camera of the Oculus on, on your head. Just simple as that. Um, and then we made this installation where if you are in VR, you become a marionette puppet. And so you look in VR and you see yourself as a marionette puppet. Um, and then on the other side of the installation, we had a leap motion. And that would actually be the marionette player. Um, so that would be this giant hand. And like these wires would appear on your hands in VR. And all of a sudden, your hands, you would see like you would be controlled. And actually, you would also see the, person hand, the person's hand um, above you, above your head in VR, because we had the data from the leap, so we could like draw that um, on top of you, on top of you, in the air. Um, that was fun and weird. Um, it was also like one of those projects that you solve with cheap solutions. So we. We didn't have a good laptop, but we had two laptops. So we had one half of the installation running from one laptop and the other half from the other laptop. And we just sent all the data through the network to, to, to each other so that we can like, make the best, make use of both the computers. Um, then I guess because I come from, it's not playing. Um, architecture, I always had a weak spot for public spaces. Um, Spaces like in a square or in a city where um, you feel like anything can happen. Um, so I wanted to make a sort of physical experience of being tracked. Because um, it's, it's like so digital right now, like we're being tracked all the time, but we're not really experiencing it when you walk through a, over a square in public space. Um, so I made this little robot um, that, oh, this was the scene that it's raining. Um, I made a little robot that drives around in public space, and then when it sees, tracks a human, it tr chases the human. Um, and then it draws a chalk line, so like sidewalk chalk. Um, so the idea was that you have this sort of physical feeling of being tracked in public space. Um, and at the same time, it would make this, that was I was imagining, this beautiful artwork on the square with the lines from chasing after people. Um, but yeah, the best thing of this project was, again, like um, the unpredictedness of behavior of people. These kids that you saw before really quickly found out that you can stop the robot if you stand in front of it, because I like, built in this algorithm that it would stop when it ran into a wall. And so they were like, oh, yeah, we can control it now. And they just kept chasing it back, driving it backwards. So they totally like, figured out the tricks to control my robot. Um, but anyway. This was actually quite a complex project, and I never really made it work properly. I just had one camera, and I did this like perspective homography thing to just get this, to make this square um, plain rectangle. 
And then this was my back end where I had, oh, actually, the yellow ball was because uh, that was my way of tracking the car. So I was just doing color tracking. So that, oh, no screen. <clears throat> so I was just using the yellow color as to know where the car is, and then I did people tracking on the people, and then I like, tried to figure out, you know, like where the car had to drive um, to to track the to trace. No, wait, chase. That's the word. Chase um, behind the people and draw these chalk lines. I made a newer version recently that is a bit better at drawing lines. Instead of with a piece of chalk, it has this like uh, chalk spray can. Um, so it looked better, but it still didn't really work. And I only had like, I didn't have a lot of time to work on it. But yeah, if anyone wants to collaborate on that, let's do it. So as you may or may not have noticed, and as Nicolas mentioned this morning, the creative tech discourse is looking more and more and more towards machine learning. And me too, I too got into machine learning. I participated in one of Gene Kogan's workshops. Um, and I have to actually say that this is really, uh, he has some really cool guides. And he has like all these Python notebooks that you can just open on your computer and run. That's how these notebooks work. And it's, it's really cool and easy to get started experimenting. And then I made this. Um, so oh, this is like not, you can't really see it <laughs> with the projector, but it's, a, it's like the T-SNE visualization of vibrators. Um, so for some context, I've, I've been participating in this sex tech hack, um, a hackathon on sex tech hosted by Goldsmiths in London. And I was super inspired by everyone's attitude and openness of talking about these subjects that have some taboo around them. So I was like, I'm going to do some machine learning, and I need some data. So I got this vibrator data set scraped around like um, sex toy websites. Um, yeah, that was fun. Last week at Hello World, the, the exhibit in Utrecht, I made a, a T-SNE installation, sort of, but it was like super hacky and made in three days, where Every person that the computer sees it makes a picture of every face that visits that exhibit. And then I immediately added the face to this T-SNE distribution thing. Um, so this next picture is also super dark. Um, but at the end of the exhibit, oh yeah, and you can't see it at all. But basically, at the end of the exhibit, you, see, you have this like, visualization of all these faces looking weird into to the installation. Like, mm -hmm. And someone actually put their baby in it too, which is really cool, because the face tracking tracked the baby too. I have not properly took the time to export the image that came out of it, but I'm going to. So if you just follow me on Twitter or something, if you want to see this, I will share it soon. But this was last week, so you know, didn't have the time to actually export that. Um, so although I love doing these silly experimental things, I actually have a full-time job. I work at, as a technologist at Tellart in Amsterdam. Tellart is a small but global experience design company. Um, we design interactive experiences um, for um, experiential marketing um, or museums. Um, so this year, I mainly worked on this project, which is um, an interactive sand table. We have done the interactive sand table before. Many people have done this interactive sand table before. Um, but we were sort of seeing it more as a medium. Um, so given the interactive sand table, what can we build upon it? And we started to think of the height maps that are constantly just, so uh, some context, if you don't know what this sand table does, it's like a sandbox, a normal sandbox, like any other sandbox. But there's a depth camera hanging above, of, above it. And so it's tracking the surface of the sand and the height of the sand. Um, and then a projector is projecting this height back onto it. So while you are moving around the sand, the projections are also changing. So it's sort of like this magical feeling of like interactive sand, kind of. Um, so we started to think of the height maps that this depth cameras generates um, based on the sand, 
um, as a height map data set, which it is. It makes sense. And so inspired by the potential of machine learning algorithms, we realized this sandbox data set could be paired with a real world data set. So we trained a pix to pix um, model, which is notorious for edges to catch cats, which you may or may not know. But it's this like thing that went viral a while ago where you draw any shape and it will try to make a, the model would try to make a cat out of it. Um, so we trained this model on pairs of real-world height maps and their corresponding real-world satellite images. Um, so we sourced hundreds of these um, image combinations you see here. Um, and then the goal was that instead of generating cats, this model will attempt to generate satellite images from any input we give it. Um, and this was the result. Actually, I'm saying it wrong. So this is not the real satellite image. This is actually the result of the, of the trained pix to pix model. Um, so it can distinguish water and beach areas and snowy mountain peaks, which is also hard to see right now. Um, but what we didn't, we didn't expect, and it's also actually really not really hard to see, but there were these dark spots on, on the side, on always the same side of the snow peaks. And we really just weren't expecting it. But basically, the model also picked up on the shadow sides of mountains, because we, we, we apparently fed it all the images with like north up. And so it actually learned the shadow sides of mountains. Um, yeah, so the projection mapping site was all open frameworks um, based on an interactive sandbox application that was um, open source um, on GitHub. And the pix to pix site is just running um, in Python, actually, not in open frameworks, um, based on Memo Octon's contributions. Um, and then we are, um, I was, I mean, I made, the, I made this installation, was just sending the texture over the GPU using Spout. Um, so the one site was Python, and the other side was open frameworks. And I was just sending the new texture um, to open frameworks using Spout. Um, yeah, I think I'll just play this video, and then that's it. Do we have audio, at least? It's a major exhibition here at the v &A, and we've brought together 100 projects which are shaping the world of tomorrow. So we introduced the show with this terrific quote from Paul Virilio, where he says, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. So contained within new ideas, new inventions, new objects, are multiple futures, good and bad, and they're completely intertwined, um, and they all happen at once. Uh, the sand table is situated within this section of the planet. Here we're looking at questions of climate change and even going beyond the Earth, so the aspirations of some people today to colonize Mars, for instance. The terraform table is made up of a depth sensing camera and a projector above a sandbox. This allows people to, with their hands, create different topographies, different hills and valleys. And the depth sensing then tells a computer and the projector what colors and patterns to project on the sand. When we first came across this combination of a depth sensing camera and a projector and a sandbox to make a three-dimensional tangible user interface was a project that was done around 2012 out at UC Davis. Since then, hundreds if not thousands of artists and designers have created iterations of this all over the world. Over the years, we've experimented with this combination of technologies. And now, this project that we're presenting is one where we've introduced artificial intelligence, or more specifically, machine learning, where we take thousands of satellite images from all over the world with corresponding high-resolution altitude data sets from those same places, and we feed them into a neural network which builds an intelligent color palette of the Earth. And we're taking this project, exhibiting it at several different places, working on a next iteration, and of course we intend to open source and publish about them back to the community. Each time we do an experiment like this, we're looking at emerging technologies and how that might change the performance characteristics 
capabilities, but we're maybe even more importantly focused on the cultural meaning of the work. And in this case, we are addressing the idea of terraforming other planets. Do humans have the right? Are they entitled to go to these pristine natural environments out in our solar system and take them over with their science and technology and transform them into places enough like Earth that they and other Earth life forms can live there? This goes beyond the conversation about whether it's technologically possible and presents a platform for reflection and debate about whether or not it's ethically responsible. That's it. <laughs>